Difficulty can be weird in video games. When done right, it can increase immersion or the feeling of accomplishment, and when done wrong, it can frustrate and turn the player off. It's a delicate topic to talk about because there's an argument to be made that the addition of an easier mode can be an accessibility feature. Still, some games, like from softwares, are made to be hard. And changing that goes against the whole concept of the games and the developer's vision. Should all games add difficulty options? Why do we seek challenge? A few games do amazing work to increase difficulty in organic and interesting ways. Others might let it disrupt the experience. The bottom line is, there are games that do difficulty right and games that do difficulty wrong. The Witcher is one of my favorite games. It still falls victim to the RPG staple of dividing enemies into levels, making it so it's really hard to kill an enemy that has a few levels above you because they take way more damage and may kill you with one hit, but it's not a huge problem that you'll encounter a lot. The thing The Witcher does brilliantly are the higher difficulties. I really believe that the best way to experience The Witcher is to play it on the highest possible difficulty, Death March. Witchers are these mutated humans with limited magical abilities that are able to drink potions and concoctions that would kill a normal human. Witchers are monster hunters. They use their knowledge, limited magic and skills to kill these creatures for money, accepting contracts from village to village. Playing the Witcher on the highest difficulty is brutal at the beginning. The enemies do a lot of damage and it only takes about 2 or 3 hits to kill you. The creatures you kill drop different kinds of parts, some specific to each creature, like the heart of a necker or the feather of a harpy, and some general to a few kinds of monsters like monster skin. As you progress, you get different contracts for different kinds of monsters that will drop different monster parts. The monsters get progressively deadlier, but there is a way to counter them. In this game, every kind of enemy has a weakness that is logical and can be exploited. Flying creatures are usually vulnerable to wind attacks. Drowners live near water and have skin similar to an amphibian, making them susceptible to fire. With the parts dropped by the monsters, you'll be able to craft armor and swords to improve your defense and attack, bombs, potions that can heal, allow you to see in the dark and help you to dive underwater for longer, and oils. You can apply these oils to your sword in order to increase your damage to a specific class of creature for a set number of hits. You have to roleplay a witcher in order to advance. You'll accept contracts in towns in order to get more coins and monster parts, experiencing the brilliant story each of them brings. You need to buy formulas for potions so you can heal more often. Potions are toxic, craft a concussion to counter that, so you can take more potions in battle. You have to actively research the game's bestiary to understand the enemy and its weaknesses. What class do they belong to? Cursed ones? Hybrids? That will define what kind of signs that they're usually vulnerable to, although that might change from creature to creature. And what kind of oil you have to apply to your sword to deal more damage? Do they deal poison damage? You need a potion to counter it. Some vampires can turn invisible, so using Moondust Bomb that releases particles of silver that monsters are vulnerable to allows them to be seen. The one's brutal difficulty gets easier and the progression is so satisfying. You increase your ability to prepare for battle. Immersion is greater because you will need to use all the tools a Witcher uses in its fights and will make combat a little more strategic and deliberate instead of just another small obstacle on your way. The higher difficulty weaves all the game's features and make it so that you have to engage with them to succeed, preparing for battle like a witcher would. If that's not your cup of tea, you don't have to engage with these features at all, you'll get through the game just fine on normal difficulties. But these layers are a brilliant way to provide a fair challenge and a smart progression for those willing to put in the work. It even has a level of player choice. I remember something that happened both times I played the game on the higher difficulties. I needed a cave troll's heart. I don't remember exactly why, but I know it was for something important. To upgrade my healing potion or for a really good monster oil. The thing is, it takes a lot of time before you come across your first cave troll. And the first ones you come across aren't exactly bad and aren't doing any harm. So how immersed are you? Are you just changing the state of a few pixels in a game or 
Are you taking an innocent life for a few advantages just because you can't be bothered to wait for a real threat? If you choose to kill the creature, nothing major will happen gameplay or story-wise. There's not much for the troll to provide after you encounter him. What fascinates me really is the choice not to kill the troll. To not kill the troll is to choose to postpone a helpful boost because of your moral compass. If the player only see it as a game, he will obviously take the creature's heart for the advantage, but if he's immersed, the choice becomes much more difficult. It becomes a question of what do you feel is right or wrong? How do you feel about those different from you? How corruptible are you? Will you blur the line of your moral because of the advantage? The game offers a lot of these choices like instances where you can choose to kill the not actually evil creature to get the reward money, but the augmented difficulty creates a few more of these choices and adds more depth and weight to a few of the existing ones. The easier difficulties make the game accessible to a lot of people and allow the player to choose how much of it he wants to engage with, and the higher difficulty rewards the player with more immersion, depth in combat and choices. The game provides a fair challenge, yet it's accessible. Difficulty can be subjective. The leveled progression of enemies that made upper level enemies kill you with one hit didn't bother me in The Witcher, but it bothers me in God of War. God of War is one of my favorite franchises, and I love the story on 2018's God of War and its sequel, Ragnarok. I'll definitely make a video on them as soon as I get the urge to replay them both but they are not games without defects. God of War has a level system in place that increases the damage and health of the enemy based on your level disparity. If the enemy is 3 levels above you, he will kill you with one hit. It's a small gripe, but it bothers me because the implementation is not great and you will encounter these enemies a lot as the games have an emphasis on exploration. The game is built around this concept that you are constantly getting tools that allow you to go to areas you couldn't before, like the Blades of Chaos that allow you to burn through obstacles that can't be destroyed otherwise. You don't need a level system when you have a solution to the player progression problem already in place in the game's structure. In contrast, a shiny example of difficulty done right are the Valkyries in God of War. Each have their own unique attacks, and the final Valkyrie blends them together into a harder fight that requires you to learn the patterns and execute responses with precision. Because the Queen Valkyrie uses some of the attacks of the others, fighting them gives you insight on the last one. I adore this fight. It's harder than the other fights. Not because of the damage she does, or because her health bar is bigger but because it's designed to put pressure on the player and push them to use every tool they have at the right time and memorize her attacks to know when to run, when to use the shield and when to be aggressive. When I first got my PS4 it was the White Destiny version. Me and my friends all bought it around the same time, so playing Destiny 1 with them was amazing. I don't play a lot of Destiny 2 nowadays, but I remember how mind-blowing the first raid experience was in Destiny 1. Raids are these huge endgame missions that could take hours, divided into areas that you'd advance by defeating a boss or completing a set of challenges. It was really, really hard, and that difficulty was a result of the raid's design. It requires smooth cooperation and coordination between six players, each with their specific tasks to advance towards the next phase. Every area was like a puzzle, even the bosses. You were well rewarded with cool armor or exclusive exotic weapons. Yes, you took a lot of damage, and yes, the enemies could get spongy depending on your level, but to succeed, you mainly needed coordination, proficiency, and the right kind of class performing the right kind of task. That is a great example of difficulty done right. Prison of Elders exemplifies the opposite. Prison of Elders was an arena with waves of enemies and some objectives in between, like defusing mines, destroying mines, or defeating a specific target. I don't remember much, but I remember how disappointed I was with that expansion. The difficulty in that mode was so lazy and unfair that it's the main thing I remember about it. It was so frustrating, 
that whenever I think of destiny, that's the main defect I think about. I remember having nowhere to hide when the game just spawned tons of enemies, getting shot in every direction, desperately trying to survive. Dying was so unfair because there was such a huge amount of bullets flying at any given time with perfect laser-like precision. It exemplifies the worst way to increase difficulty of a mode, which is just to increase the number of enemies, the damage they deal or their health bar. I can't really talk about difficulty without mentioning from software games. As I stated, difficulty options can be a way of allowing more people to experience your games. But from software games are hard and that's all you get, a straight up hard game. You don't choose your difficulty in the menus, the game is what it is, you just press play. The enemies are hard and you need to understand how they work. Their weaknesses and their movement patterns succeed. Your only option is trial and error. A lot of the challenges you face in these games are the ones you put upon yourself. You don't have to defeat a boss as soon as you face him. You can measure its strength and come back later. There was an enemy I faced in Elden Ring that greatly exemplifies that. Me and my friend were both separately facing the same boss. It was a huge boss that definitely looked like it was supposed to be faced later in the game. Not only dealt a stupid amount of damage, indicating that we were severely underleveled, but it also was a huge boss confined in a small space, creating tons of situations that could get you stuck in a corner, defenseless. After a few attempts, my friend decided to retreat and face him later. I decided to keep trying. I probably spent half a day to defeat an enemy that was clearly supposed to be faced later, but sometimes I'm hard-headed and I just didn't want to let go. My friend faced him later and probably had a way better experience because the fight wasn't easy, but it wasn't unfair. The difficulty I had at that moment was self-imposed. The fights in these games are usually fair, but when you are underleveled, they are less so. You can easily realize when that's the case and retreat to fight later. The difficult bosses in these games are always satisfying to defeat because of the feeling of barely overcoming something that seemed too hard. I probably should have done the same thing my friend did and the process would have been almost as satisfying and a lot less frustrating. But there is also a little bit of pleasure from defeating a boss or going to an area the game didn't expect you to yet. The games are as hard as you want them to. You can farm, killing easier enemies so you can increase your level and make the fights easier. There are ways to make your character overpowered. There are also different classes that don't have to be as close to the bosses as a regular knight. Everything you do from summoning a player to searching for a PvP encounter is done by interacting with the items and mechanics inside the game. Some bosses have gimmicky ways of defeating them, or some ways of weakening them. You can summon players and NPCs to help you and diverge the boss's attention. The game gives you all the tools to adjust the difficulty inside the game. It offers you different ways to succeed, it just won't hold the player's hand to show them. Sekiro is hugely different from all of their games. That's the reason some people find it harder and others find it easier than their past games. In the other Souls games, you have the possibility of making strength, dexterity, magic, and faith build, all with different mechanics and moves, a huge variety of weapons in each class. All of that has to be balanced so that different builds are viable. Sekiro answers the question, what if From Software took all of that effort and focused on only one type of combat? It's harder because you must adapt to it, and it's easier because you become a menace once you do. That's Sekiro's greatest flaw for the most hardcore fans of the franchise, and its best quality. The result? Sekiro has the single best progression in all of video games. I understand fans of their games not loving Sekiro as it's a huge deviation from their other games and doesn't feature a lot of what they love about them, but it's one of my favorite games because what it does right, it does better than any other game. 
you lose all of the flexibility and variety of the previous games, the multiplayer and the cryptic story in favor of a more linear one and a more focused combat experience. You don't create your character and play the way you prefer, you play as Sekiro and you fight as Sekiro would. Instead of dodging, waiting for an opening and attacking, you deflect and attack, constantly maintaining pressure on your enemy trying to break their posture so you can deal some real damage. If you stop, they will regain some of it back. All the bosses teach you a lesson and gradually make you better. As you progress, you learn parrying and the timing of it, varying from different types of attack. From one boss, you learn the importance of deflecting and the use of the grappling hook to close distance when needed. From another, you learn and master to dodge in the direction of your enemy when they inflict a piercing attack to deal a huge amount of damage to their posture. Then from another, you learn that you can jump on their head at specific moments and deal more damage to their posture. You learn that when they attack you with electricity, you can jump and swing your sword in the air to deflect the electricity back to them. All of those are different ways of improving your combat skills. Leveling up allows your character to unlock some of them, but the bosses are the ones who teach the player how to use them. The combat is constantly honing the player's skills and teaching them so they can finally apply them in the end. The whole game is a tutorial for the final boss. It's a brutal fight that requires you to apply all of your learnings from the other bosses and learn the boss's sometimes lightning fast pattern. After defeating him, you'll finally have mastered Sekiro. That's the key thing in Sekiro. Like Outer Wilds, a game that, once you beat it, you know its secrets and can easily beat it again. The combat provides the same experience. Once you beat the game, you can easily defeat the bosses you had a hard time with. Because most of Sekiro's skill progression focuses on the player, not the character. Like Sekiro, you honed your skills and have mastered combat after facing its toughest challenges. Like in Outer Wilds, you have learned the core of the game and it will not be the same afterwards. The difficulty was the player's learning curve, your learning curve. That is the core of that game and why its progression is brilliant. There is a reason as to why I don't usually play on New Game Plus, and that's because most of the times when I replay a game, it's been some time since I last played it, I don't quite remember all of the moves and tools at my disposal. Instead of learning organically to use them by gradually unlocking the skills and applying them in combat, one at a time, I have all of them in front of me, without remembering how to properly use them or blend them together. Of course, there are moments when you want to play on New Game Plus, like I am at the very moment in Alan Wake 2, to re-experience the story and watch the new content and not have to worry about getting the items and abilities. But if you want to re-experience the game after some time, playing on New Game Plus is lackluster. The game believes that you remember it, so it won't seamlessly teach you how to handle situations that someone who just played it would easily know how. Progression is flat and that takes away from the experience. In God of War, you'll unlock new skills that will improve combat and allow you to go to areas you couldn't before, incentivizing exploration. And there is a level of progression added by your fights with the Valkyries. You learn their moves and powers until you eventually fight the last harder one that blends all of them together. Sekiro uses that concept throughout the whole game teaching the player how to fight, react to, and hone their skills to fight the last boss, which requires them to understand and use every aspect of the game to win. There is an in-game progression, but the focus is the player's progression, just like in Destiny's Raids. In Destiny's Raids, player coordination is key. You've got to learn your role in every part of it, and must train to coordinate well with your team to succeed. The Witcher's progression is enhanced by its hardest mode. You'll have a hard time at the beginning and will eventually learn how to deal with all the creatures and explore their every weakness. You'll unlock new gear, potions, oils and bombs that will make your fights easier if you know how to take advantage of them. You can do all of that in the other difficulties, but you are required to do most of them in the last difficulty in order to succeed. There are a few reasons as to why we'd want a harder game. 
In The Witcher, you are rewarded with a deeper combat, immersion, and moral choices. Games like God of War are story-driven. The form, that is, the combat, it's not the highlight, but the story. By providing accessibility options and difficulty modes to choose from, you allow more players to experience your games, and that's a great thing. We should push for more games to provide accessibility so more people can enjoy games, but difficulty can be a little different. Sekiro is a teacher who guides you through its motions, helps you to learn, and slaps your hand when you miss. You can't make it easy on a student because the form is the whole point, to learn to forge your blade. The game won't adapt to you, you must adapt to it. It teaches you the move and the rhythm so you can make your own sword, finally mastering Sekiro. The Souls games have difficulty as part of their essence. It's hard and punishing, but you rarely lose a fight not knowing it was your fault. To be pushed to the limit by a boss and defeat it is an incredible feeling of satisfaction that you don't get in most games. This type of difficulty is carefully crafted and incredibly hard to pull off. We seek that difficulty because the feeling of overcoming it is unmatched. There's a reason from software games resonate so well with people with depression, and why we see so many stories of people who claim that Dark Souls helped them to get through it. We see these stories about multiple games a result of the power games have to immerse us in their world by demanding engagement and providing escapism, but we see even more so about Souls games. The worlds are hopeless and oppressive. The character? A blank canvas in which the player can build their own way of playing. Even in Sekiro, that deviates a little from that, you play as the bodyguard of the actual special person. You are a nobody in a dark and punishing world that will throw everything it has at you to put you down. There are very few people you can trust. The bonfires in which you rest to regain your strength are little safe havens in between a dark and cruel reality. It's a warped representation of how someone in a depressive state might view the world. Hard, oppressive, punishing, bleak, alone. You beat the game as a representation of you, the class you relate to the most, the clothes you think look the best, the skills and weapons you think are more suited to your playstyle. The game world is beautiful, yet dead, hopeless and crumbling. In a reddit post by Lucid State titled How Dark Souls Helped Me Move Past Depression, I remember Solaire in his revelation that many other souls were experiencing the exact same situation in other dimensions, that countless other souls like myself were lingering in emptiness, in loneliness, in terrible perpetuity. You might feel powerless, but you learn how to fight. You'll die a few times each day, but you'll get up and keep trying. And the thing is, you can always summon a player to help you. Soldiers in their own empty worlds, in their own respective hells, were coming into mind to help me face a terrifying and indomitable task. And we did it. We brought them down. And then, in a blink, they were gone, cast back into the emptiness. It doesn't matter how you play these games, finishing them is an accomplishment. The struggle it provides creates determination. By overcoming these challenges, maybe you can overcome anything. The world you once thought you were powerless to becomes manageable. You are not alone. Others are facing the same problem. You can always reach out. I began to summon help of my own, counselors, friends, different schools of thought. We should get difficulty options in most games, but I'm also grateful for the games that teach us that we too can overcome the hardest of situations. Even if the world looks bleak, we have the power to endure. Thank you for watching this far, if you enjoyed the content, subscribe to see more like this.
I am really grateful to every single one of you who always let me know that you enjoyed the videos, that it spoke to you in some way, or that there is something I can improve upon. Thank you.